right, ladies and gentlemen, today is February 21st, 2018. And on behalf of the director of the U.S. Army Heritage and Education Center, Colonel Jeffrey Mangelsdorf, and the entire staff at the USAC and the U.S. Army War College, welcome to the Perspectives in Military History Lecture Series. The USAC and the U.S. Army War College sponsor the Perspective Series to provide a historical dimension to the exercise of generalship, strategic leadership, and the warfighting institutions of land power. In addition, as always, we would like to extend a warm thank you to the Army Heritage Center Foundation for everything they do to help us out here at the USAHEC. The book for tonight's lecture, as you saw, is on sale uh, in the gift shop and behind the lecture hall. All proceeds from the book sales do go directly to the Army Heritage Center Foundation to help them construct this facility uh, and to support our uh, programs here. Uh, we'll also, of course, have a book signing after the lecture. So ladies and gentlemen, it is my great honor tonight to introduce our speaker and to say a few words about his co-author. Mr. Patrick Gregory has spent most of his career in journalism, covering world events for the BBC for over 30 years, before moving on to a job of, 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 as the news editor and then managing editor for the BBC's political programs department. He also produced several documentaries for the BBC World Service and the BBC Radio 4 before authoring an American, American in Western, on the Western Front. His co-author, Elizabeth Nurser, is the niece of Arthur Kimber, the subject of tonight's lecture. She moved from California, USA to Cambridge, UK in the 1950s as a Fulbright Scholar. She worked as a copy editor and editor for Cambridge University Press, Melbourne University Press, and Faber and Faber before opening her own publishing house. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome Mr. Patrick Gregory. First of all, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much indeed for coming here tonight. It's uh, an honor to speak to you. And thank you to Carl, uh, who's the program coordinator, as you know, and to Jeffrey Mangelsdorf as director of the Heritage Education Centre. As the more observant of you will have realised by this stage, although I'm sure you're all very observant, I am not, in fact, American. <laughs> uh, this accent originally uh, hails from Northern Ireland uh, via London, where I live and work. And so it is a fair question uh, to wonder, as you may be, why on earth a non-American in America is talking to Americans about America in World War I and about a book, An American on the Western Front. Um, it all began six, seven years ago when my co-author, uh, Elizabeth Nurser, and I got together to pour over a large collection of letters she had of a relative, her uncle, as Carl says, who was a serviceman in World War I. Elizabeth is, I'm glad to say, American, um, so there may yet be some reason to listen. Um, and uh, heaven help her, she also doubles in her day-to-day -day life as my mother-in-law. Um, so I, I want to look, the purpose of it really, I want to look at, at World War I through the eyes of this particular young serviceman, Arthur Clifford Kimber, why? Because through his experiences, through his words, we can benefit from some very valuable first-hand testimony of the war. But also, it's around the edges of his story that we can also glean some of the wider shape of the United States' role at this time before as well as after America's time as a full competent in the war. So if we can start with the United States and its attitude to war in the summer of 1914, when famously, I don't need to tell you, President Woodrow Wilson did not want to take part or have any, any part in the war that was breaking out in July and early August of 1914. America didn't have a dog in the fight. What was going on in Europe did not have any bearing on American foreign policy or participation of any benefit for America. Myron Herrick, who was the United States ambassador in Paris, was still hopeful that he would at least Wilson be involved 
to the extent that he would call upon, as Herrick asks him, uh, for make, to make a strong plea to the Allies and to the uh, apparent aggressors in, in Austria, Hungary, and Germany. A strong plea for delay and moderation from the President of the United States, says Herrick, would meet with the respect and approval of Europe. Well, I'm not entirely sure about that. I think that they were too far gone at this stage. Um, and in any case, as I say, Wilson uh, did not want to go down that particular avenue. Uh, the US would stay resolutely on the sidelines. Neutrality, the watchword to be, in Wilson's phrase, neutral in thought as well as in action. <coughs> but in Europe, that neutrality, that American neutrality, I put it in inverted commas, was to have a very active manifestation for Herrick and the Paris Embassy and for uh, a legion of young Americans who would come over. The embassy and the American expatriate uh, community in uh, France in particular began to organize medical relief efforts. The American Ambulance Hospital in uh, Neuilly in the west of Paris was opened, uh, a volunteer um, um, independent military hospital, but it would go on in its later uh, guise to play a more directly supportive role in the French war effort. In the months which followed uh, America's entry into the war, um, we had uh, people, young men, usually young men, with ties of family or friendship who would make their way to Paris to offer their services at the hospital and then increasingly to work in makeshift field hospitals and then to join a number, one of a number of ambulance units then uh, being formed. And um, these young men, a lot of them were college men from Ivy League colleges, including from here in the University of Pennsylvania. They came to join uh, three main groupings, as, as, as it was the Hargis Formation, which is named after the senior partner of the Morgan Hargis Bank, old J.P. Morgan. The second, that formed by a, an archaeologist, Richard Norton, the Anglo-American Corps. And the third, what would be the largest, the American Field Service, which grew out of the military hospital I talked about. And in, in total, over the period, 14 to 17, before America was in the war, some 3,500 Americans served in these ambulance corps. It was the first organized American presence on the Western Front. And Kimber, Arthur Clifford Kimber, will find himself drawn laterally to that. They weren't the only uh, non-competent uh, 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 ambulancier, as they say. Uh, they weren't the only ambulancier to serve um, uh, before, before the US um, uh, joined the conflict. Um, Americans also enrolled in, in the armed forces of Canada, or in Canada, to serve with the, the British Empire, as many as 35,000 men. And likewise, directly in the British armed forces, and also American foreign legionnaires who served with the French forces, most notably and most eye-catchingly the pilots of the Lafayette Escadrille and later Lafayette Flying Corps who flew as part of the French Air Service. They would go on to form an important spine within the then fledgling US Air Service which took to the skies in 1918. Just as the American Field Service initially attracted Arthur Clifford Kimber, also the air service would find an echo in what he wanted to do. So who was Arthur Clifford Kimber? He was a 21-year-old who left uh, as a student at Stanford University, who left uh, Stanford a few months before taking his final courses. But he'd actually come originally from uh, uh, New York, born in 1896. His father was an Episcopal clergyman who uh, worked in the Bowery. It was a, an off, off spin from uh, Trinity Wall Street and a mission church. And he built this up in the 1870s, 1880s. Um, 
Kimber Sr. wanted to save souls, but also to give a trade to the successive waves of immigrants coming off the boats from the old world. He and his wife wanted, alongside a promised afterlife, that in this life, men and women would be able to gain useful employment, teaching them various carpentry, midwifery skills, etc. It was in this endeavor that the Reverend Kimber uh, came into contact with Theodore Roosevelt when Roosevelt was the city's police commissioner in the mid-1890s. Roosevelt was a, attempting to limit opening hours of New York saloons on the Sabbath and shrink the sizes of glass beer, uh, glasses beer was sold in, and Kimber wanted to keep folk away from this demon drink. They found common cause. They wanted to keep families together. Roosevelt wanted to have fewer people brawling in the streets and, out of, uh, and to get them out of hospitals into productive labor. The two also knew each other from summers they would spend out in Long Island uh, on Oyster Bay, Sagamore Hill, and uh, a place that uh, Kimber had built in Bayville. But to spin on from that, um, in 1909, uh, uh, suddenly the uh, Reverend Kimber died, and it was a year after he'd uh, taken, he'd been to Europe with his sons. His two older sons had been in boarding school in England, and had taken them after their year in boarding schools in England to France, a uh, little tour of Europe, when the young Kimber, Arthur Clifford Kimber, saw uh, Wilbur Wright uh, uh, demonstrating the Wright Model 1 aircraft. That captured him. And um, the, what happened then, upon the death of his, soldier, of his father, was that uh, the family relocated in a state of some uh, impecunity from the East Coast to the West Coast. Um, young Kimber, um, initially settling in Berkeley before going on to uh, uh, Palo Alto and Stanford. In the Berkeley Hills, he would build gliders, fly them, crash them, dust himself down, try again. And um, he puts that to one side uh, in order to concentrate on his studies from 1914 onwards. Um, but he's taken with the idea of service in the war. He wants to do his bit. He is a uh, Roosevelt, a uh, friend of his father, was by this stage a hero of his. And uh, he felt that uh, Roosevelt's call to arms of America to serve on the front is something that he himself should follow. Um, he was going to go in an initial uh, um, Stanford ambulance unit of the AFS in the early part of 17, before war was called. Um, he delayed by another couple of months. And when America joined the war in April 17, he was asked, he, he put together a, a second ambulance unit from Stanford, but he then um, was asked to carry what would be the first official US government flag to go to the front. And this is where the letters, this is where his story really begins in terms of how we're able properly to tell it. Um, he sets off after a, a large ceremony in the Civic Auditorium in San Francisco. Uh, he sets off across America uh, to another ceremony, a big parade down Fifth Avenue in New York uh, on the 10th of May, 1917. The date is significant because on the days either side of them, uh, we had Joffre and Balfour, uh, the uh, visiting French and British war delegations uh, uh, leading their initial uh, um, um, delegations to exhort the American government and the American public to uh, get into the war uh, with all of the manpower at their service as quickly as possible. And Kimber was leading his, uh, his parade of young, young Stanford and Berkeley graduates down Fifth Avenue. But the, the, the letters as they begin uh, at this stage in America, then he are written at a rate of two or three a week, every week 
for 18 of the 19 months of US involvement in the war. And we can see the First World War, firstly, in America, the reaction to America going in, and then wartime Britain, wartime France. We can see all this with a fresh eye that is like a relative writing back to you, a most detailed postcard, giving you a little on the ground summary of what's going on, why it's going on. He sets off on uh, the SS St. Louis, which was the, the first armed passenger ship to set sail from New York after hostilities were joined as this set off in mid-May of 17. Um, and uh, on board, among others, Lillian Gish, the actress, uh, who tried sadly, unsuccessfully to chat up. Lillian Gish wasn't having any of it. But all of this, um, what had been an adventure, an excitement, um, suddenly towards the business end of the voyage, as they get into the submarine infested waters of the southern Irish coast where the Lusitania had been sunk, suddenly it all gets a little bit real. And um, I'm going to start here uh, at this point, giving you a flavor of, of, some, of the, some of the letters. So Kimber writes, we are now about at the spot where the Lusitania went down when she, when she was unarmed and unconvoyed. We passed an empty lifeboat early this morning, also considerable wreckage, etc. Some life preservers were seen and two or three bodies were spotted from the bridge, some poor victims of the German U-boats. And later, about five, we passed some bales of cotton and barrels of oil from some wrecked ship. The following day, he writes, last night, Monday night, was the most dangerous of the trip because of our being right in the submarine zone. Many people sat up all night, and a few of them took off their clothes. Nearly all the nurses on my deck slept either on deck or in the saloon. It was awfully funny when I returned to my room at 4.30 a.m. He'd got up to watch the sun rise with some of the others, and we passed through the, the saloon to see ladies lying on the sofas, and in the main entrance, men fully dressed lying on the floor. Those who stretched out on the deck not only nearly froze to death, but stiffened themselves for days to come. This idea of sleeping dressed in the upper decks is all bunk. He thinks that there's going to be plenty of time once torpedoed to actually get dressed fully in one's suit and make off. They arrive safely in Liverpool the following day, and uh, he writes about the first troops he encounters in Liverpool. As we, draw, as we drew up at the dock, we saw lots of soldiers and gallantly clothed officers. Some Highlanders were there, Hindus, Irish, Welsh, etc., and presented quite an interesting appearance. And then a few hours later, as he boards a train, as I looked at the passengers get on the train, many soldiers were getting on to go back to their trenches after a leave of absence, and their mothers, sisters, and sweethearts were saying goodbye to them. The men tried to be brave and not show their emotion, but the women were one and all, without exception, breaking down and weeping. He gets to London and reports on the somber mood of what he sees in wartime London. Late Wednesday night, I went down to Charing Cross Station and saw some wounded arrive. There was quite a crowd and they cheered heavily. Then an ambulance brought out the badly wounded the crowds no longer made a noise for fear of disturbing the men, but quietly waved, and the game soldiers smiled and made feeble efforts to wave back. London is a regular morgue, dark and quiet at night. It's almost gloomy, and in the day it's quiet and dead. Similar picture in wartime Paris when he gets there. Few of the men, he says, look happy. They seem tired and careworn, dogged and yet melancholy, almost discouraged as if they believed the war was never going to end. They need something to cheer up and stir up their pep. 
They should be supplanted by husky American troops and given a much needed rest. And they know that their poor families are practically starving for want of food and clothing, yet they cannot buy it for they're paid practically nothing. France is nearly exhausted. The US has entered at the 11th hour. American troops and flags are needed to rehearten the French poilu, the French regular soldier. Kimber has the excitement of uh, the ceremony when the flag is handed over on the 4th of June, 1917, outside the small town of Treveret, about 50 miles from Verdun, handed over to a color party of the uh, first Stanford unit of the field service, of the, the American Ambulance Field Service, and is handed over by a colonel of the French division to which they were attached. But even then, his first taste of war service with the AFS is tinged with the kind of excitement. It's almost, as I'm saying about him being a, a, a good person, or almost like a relative writing these first-hand accounts back on detailed postcards. In this case, he sounds almost like a tourist at a 4th of July party. During the night, he says, the Germans have started a barrage preliminary to an attack it was wonderful. The French batteries replied and made a regular curtain of fire in the back of us. A German incendiary shell hit a big pile of rockets and made the most glorious sight that I've ever seen with fireworks. All during the night, both sides sent up rockets, star shells, and red, white, and green lights. It was wonderful. As morning broke, the hill was covered with smoke and dirt thrown up by the shells. The gunfire sounded like a tattoo. It was so fast and regular. The boys had never heard such a barrage before. It was dangerous work, but effect and effectively still shift work. There were not yet US Army regulations. Um, it was exciting, dangerous work for young men, driven by a sense of duty, yet also after some action. Um, however, it wasn't long before the raw realities of war forced their way through to him and all of his, all of his comrades in arms. Not in arms, actually. Not yet. One of their first key first aid posts was uh, about 50 feet from a crossroads that the Germans were constantly shelling. And he's ferrying the injured uh, French soldiers and maimed soldiers from the front line to rear guard hospitals. And he then goes on a trip to visit the utter desolation of Mortom and Hill 301, 304. I don't know if you know Mortom and 304, but it's a scene of some very fierce fighting at Verdun between 16 and 17, seeing villages on the way raised to the ground. He says, it was the most barren kind of a waste torn and cut up by shell fire. Not a bit of vegetation remained. Hills nearby had bits of green, but Mortom, not a thing. The strange thing to me is that the Germans threw so many men away in trying to take this one hill. Of course, Mortom has a strategic importance, but even if the Bosch took it, and many others, there would still be hundreds of hills left for the gallant French to defend. I can't describe all we saw, we simply stared around and wondered. Occasionally, as the wind blew from the lines at no man's land, it carried a sickening odor. Other things equally horrible don't bear mentioning. By the autumn of 17, Kimber joined the US Air Service. He'd, uh, he thought that the time of doing that ambulance work had passed. He wanted to get into the action, do a proper, now that the uh, we were getting some troops into the field, he should do his bit, but it was the air that captured his imagination. And um, the manufacture and supply of American built craft, even when they did come, was some way off. So he was training, as was the norm with many, in a three-stage process of basic training, advanced training, and gunnery school, a lot of it done by French instructors. instructors and he did these at various uh, centers around France, at Tours, and in Issoudun, and at Cazot, up until the spring of 1918. 
and um, he starts to write about the, uh, the joy um, of flying. It is wonderful to fly these fast little one-seater planes. You feel so, so like a bird and have such control in the air. You look out at the wings and there are only four wires on either side holding them and one V-strut either side. Great stuff. The world is below and you are in another world, challenging the eagle in his domain. Cut your motor and you float silently and feel perfect peace and are absolutely safe. Zigzag banking at 60 degrees or ride up and down, zooming and diving. You are alone and the avion de chasse is a fiery pegasus and you learn to love it and care for it like a comrade. But he feels the cold. This is training is in uh, deep midwinter, the end of, end of December. He says, the morning's flying was the coldest I've ever been through. One boy froze his nose and another his right cheek. The former rubbed snow on it to thaw it out and took the skin off. If you have a slight cold, flying in weather like this makes your nose run like a fountain and provides a lot of freezable matter. My feet were like ice. On the ground, they were first cold, then felt warm, a bad sign. So I had to jump up and down till they got cold again. In the air, they were numb. It's high time Uncle Sam supplied us with the promised flying clothes. He writes about the, the danger of being in planes like this. Uh, he, he's kind of caught between trying to reassure his mother that it's all absolutely tickety-boo, it's really very safe, and he's very lucky he's not going to be in any trenches. Um, but then, unfortunately, there is the, the uh, once again, reality of it and some of the, the danger that he's in. And he's uh, writing here, about 10 minutes before I landed at my destination at Epernay, my left foot began feeling funny and sort of tingling. For a while, I thought nothing of it, as often the vibration of the rudder bar makes one's feet feel sleepy and numb. But about four or five minutes before I landed, my foot got really uncomfortable. It felt cold and wet, as if I was being pricked by pins and needles. So I ducked my head down under. Horrors! It was drenched with gasoline. My leg was wet halfway up to my knee. The shoe and putty were spongy. A veritable stream of essence came pouring down. The gas pipe from the gravity tank had cracked and half the gas flow was escaping. The bottom of the fuselage was drenched and the gas fumes were awful. A backfire and away we would go. If the gas worked to the magneto and was sparked off, it would be good night. Anyway, gladly manages a safe landing, barring a cracked uh, tail sk uh, skid. Um, you describe how, you know, right enough, it was a, a fear of how all pilots uh, really didn't want to go burning up. But he gets a receipt for his plane, gets his shoe and sock off, washes them, puts blister powder on, and then goes to uh, get something to eat and go to the YMCA for a movie. He is enjoying himself in between such episodes and he's, um, because they're still doing their training stage, they still haven't got a gig to go to, they still haven't been sent to the front. So he, he stunts around some on days that he can, delivering a plane from one airfield to another airfield at the advanced school. He will go off at off piste a little bit and buzz down around some interesting chateau that he would see. and. Um, he says, lately I've been making a habit of singling out good-looking chateaux, circling over them. If I like them, I stunt a bit. Friday morning, I flew over one, about 10 kilometers from here. Several fair ones came to a second-story window and leaned out to get a better view of my plane. So when I saw these charmants, I decided to hold an inspection, and therefore, flying very low, I zigzagged into position and skimmed over the trees in front of the loge. Ah, très bon. I repeated the performance and waved a bonjour, bucking my plane like a bronco to emphasize my good spirits. They all replied and seemed delighted. Well, maybe, maybe not, I've not an idea. But then in an interlude, which tells us something about the overall American uh, uh, war effort this stage, just to park Kimber on the side, a period of waiting while men and materiel and training, the supply chain reaches a critical mass. 
and the shape of the war begins to form. Kimber is cooling his heels for several months, waiting for the nod to go to the front, and he waits, and he waits very impatiently. The Allies and the Americans were in a state of readiness is not the right word, anticipation, over the winter of 17 into 18. And it wasn't until late March 1918, with Americans at a very early stage of preparations, that Ludendorff, the German commander, uh, launches the first of his, what will be, five offensive, offensives with stretch on spring to summer of 18. We need to take a step back, though, uh, to look at the American war effort, how best to characterize it. Often uh, overlooked or downplayed, certainly in Europe, but also curiously somewhat neglected here in America also. Historically, I believe, of huge significance, the first time that the United States had acted in a full military and political capacity on the world stage, and it was the beginning of the American century. John Pershing was having a tough time trying to get his armies into the field, transporting them, equipping them, training them, blooding them in warfare, more especially trying to fight off the interest of Britain and France in attempting to amalgamate them, a division here, a division there, to plug holes in the Allied lines on the front, arguing the toss with the Allies about what priority to give troops and artillery. Pershing wanted to form together a fully fledged ar army uh, with a supply operation going through from the American and European production line to the front line. But as I say, the Allies wanted to plug holes, a division here, a division there. Pershing held fast, largely. There were, during the emergency of the spring offensives, of course, necessarily, the AEF were pressed into action as and where necessary and fought the good fight. So what did the United States bring to the war when they entered? Um, I would say the four M's of money, morale, men, materiel, and in that order. In fact, money had been happening all the way through, even before America was in the fight. The credit uh, advanced by the United States to Britain and France and other combatant nations Morale was a vital component as well. Never uh, underestimate that. April 1917 was a time where the Allied war effort had taken a severe dent in confidence. Revolution in Russia had already seen off Tsar Nicholas. The Eastern Front was collapsing. And when the Eastern Front did collapse, and it was a question of when, Germany would be free to pursue its fight in France and Belgium unhindered. In April of 1917, as America prepared to join the war, the Nivelle Offensive in France and the Battle of Arras stumbled very badly. So much faith had been placed on Nivelle and the faith had proved to be misplaced. Mutinies followed within the French ranks. So the news that America was coming that same month, never mind how long mobilization was going to take, came as a shot in the arm, a huge morale boost. The money, though, that I mentioned, the other big important factor, was already much in evidence even before America came into the war. America, allies were increasingly dependent upon the Atlantic lifeline and the Atlantic cash line for all manner of supplies. Britain, for example, by the summer of 1916, was spending the modern equivalent of $25 million a day on the war, of which 10 million was being raised in loans in Wall Street. The final bill was just shy of $10 billion. So to the men and materiel, a constant source of friction, as I've already alluded to in the Allies Supreme War Council, the amalgamation crisis, the pressure, political and military, that Pershing was under to release men by the division load. 
to put into British and French armies, pressure applied directly to him and on him, and uh, also to his bosses, uh, Wilson and, and Secretary of War Newton Baker, to bring their men into line. Plans were also put in place to restrict American transport efforts to just infantry uh, divisions coming over, just give us the men, or give us the men and the machine gun units, or artillery pieces. Not as Pershing wanted, and as I've said, a complete complement of men, of engineers, logistics support services, and all of the heavy kit that would go with it. Eventually, compromises reached, and uh, Pershing did say, fair enough, for a number of months, we will just bring over largely men, um, hatched a plan with the Brits, the six division plan, that the Brits would then train six division loads of Americans as they came in. But, he said, going back to the, the original instructions he'd been given in May of 1917 when he went to Europe, he said that he was there to cooperate with the forces of the other countries employed against the enemy, cooperate, but the underlying idea must be kept in view that the forces of the United States are a separate and distinct component of the combined forces, the identity of which must be preserved. He wrote to Baker, our forces should not be dissipated except for a temporary emergency that now arrives in, we're spinning on into the spring and summer offensive of 1918 by Ludendorff. Our forces should not be dissipated except for a temporary emergency. Our position will be stronger if our army acting as such will have played a distinct and definite part. He does have to do that, though. He does have to bite the bullet. Um, looking briefly at the troops that he was bringing in, who were going to be doing some of this fighting, initial fighting, the first to arrive were appropriately the first division, regulars, the big red one, who would go on to be the apple of Pershing's eye, the ultra dependables, who would be used time and time again over the course of the American war. Not long after the first came the second division, like the first irregular division, but assembled in France from other units which had arrived piecemeal. And then the uh, two National Guard divisions, the 26th from Connecticut, Massachusetts, and the 42nd, the famous Rainbow uh, Division. Together, these four, the big four, were the first to arrive, but by the turn of the year 1718, they were still the only four combat units in the field. In time, they would come, the 32nd in February, we've just uh, come to the anniversary of that now, the 3rd Division in March, and then a trickle um, which had been going for 11 months, became a flood with 10 divisions arriving in April and May, around a third of the overall AEF strength, including from here the famous 28th Iron Division from Pennsylvania. Um, it was a slow and gradual build-up of these forces' participation but um, America came to the party in uh, May, late May 18, at Cantigny. That was the first American-led uh, assault, a successful three-day battle about 20 miles uh, south of Amiens in the north of France, um, won by the 1st Division, the, the, the big red one, commanded by Robert Lee Bullard. Relatively small in the grand scheme of things, Cantigny, but Pershing's men had proven their allied doubters wrong. The Americans could fight and hold their own. The only slight problem with Cantigny, as wonderful as it was, they proved themselves in the field. The only slight problem was that it proved to be something of a sideshow, because just as that was being put to bed at Cantigny, the real action was happening 80 miles southeast with Ludendorff's third offensive. And he started Ludendorff. The German armies advanced rapidly over the Aisne River and the, uh, the Ork River and the Vale River, advanced rapidly, flanking 
Reims, Reims, the capital of Champagne, to be on the Marne, just over 50 miles away from, from Paris. Psychologically, hugely significant, hugely important. The ultimate goal, Paris. Um, that's when the Americans in the second and third divisions were drafted in, um, holding Chateau Thierry, a key town there on the Marne. This became the second Battle of the Marne, the beginnings of the second Battle of the Marne, holding Chateau Thierry and also then forcing their way northwest of Chateau Thierry into two places, uh, 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 Vaux and Bello Wood. Bello Wood would be a famous, a famous battle uh, where um, fought in a, a square mile of, of forest, brutal inter interlude, um, lasted three weeks in this dense forest, um, quite savage fighting, um, medieval in, in some respects. Uh, some of the uh, toad stickers were being used, which were large knuckle dusters with six to eight inch uh, blades, and uh, Marines were involved here. And um, they would go in, one of them saying, we used butt strike and slash, but no sticking because of pressure, time pressure. It must have lasted a good 15 minutes before they finally broke. Even they were aware that it was fairly brutal stuff that they were inflicting on them. The Marines, said Bullard, didn't win the war here, but they saved the Allies from defeat. Had they arrived a few hours later, I think that would have been the beginning of the end. France could not have, stu have stood the loss of Paris. Now, Kimber was aware that he wasn't in this fight yet. He wasn't yet on the ground. He wasn't in the air. He wasn't he wasn't getting involved. In particular, he was aware, very conscious of the fact as an aviator that there were Americans, French, British on the ground in trenches and on murderous open ground who were fighting bloody battles and suffering casualties. And uh, aware of his position by comparison, he writes, four officers came in last night, one blinded by gas. It's horrible. Thank the Lord I fly. With me, the chances are I'll get off scot-free or be killed instantly. It's a great consolation after seeing those wounded and maimed heroes, incapacitated for life. But I pity the poor, poor fellows in the trenches. They are the men who will win this war. They suffer more than any of us and live in a regular hell. Hats off, hats off to them. They hold the line. And he writes fatalistically, an aviator's death is not a hard way to die. It is instantaneous. We do not fear it. I had a close call when I fell from 1,500 meters to less than 500. A few seconds more and all would have been over. But I wasn't thinking of what might happen. Confusion is fatal. A man must keep his head. One good thing about aviation is you're killed instantly or not at all. There's no lingering death but I hope and pray that if I meet in the service of my country, I meet it at the front, at the hands of the Hun, and fall like a shot eagle. C'est la guerre. He was fond of his French with Arthur Clifford Kimber. He goes on in the later spring and summer uh, to be what they called a ferryman, uh, ferrying planes from the uh, uh, production line from the airfield uh, 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 to the, the front where they were needed. Uh, every imaginable plane for those people in the room who knows these things, French largely, some British planes, Sopwiths, but he's flying Newports and Spads, and he flew just about everything that anyone manufactured at the time. Um, eventually, he gets his gig. He gets, he gets into action um, with, uh, with the French 85th Escadrille, one of the old Lafayette Flying Corps, and um, he... Just, just a, a, a brief thing there. They all had their own little insignia on the side of their aircraft. We had the famous Hattonless Ring Squadron or the Kicking Mule Squadron. Um, in the case of the, the, the French uh, 85th, they used to have um, a, uh, 
uh, a Tyrus bull on it, and um, they wanted, once one commander left, to change it to a different insignia, which they did, and they, they put a joker on it, a joker with a trident, and the first person, they, they, he got a, a brand new SPAD uh, a 13 plane, and the first person to get this new logo on the side of a new plane was, was Kimber. And I discovered in the course of, of, of doing this book that that little insignia is still on the tail fin of, 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 of aircraft flown by the French NATO planes, which are trainers. But Kimber then goes on to fight in uh, the two big set-piece battles of the Americans um, at the end of the war. The first was Saint Miel, which was a relatively short-lived affair, very efficient, possibly a sledgehammer to crack a nut, but a three-day, four-day job, boom, all done, cutting off a, a salient in northeast France. Um, he got badly shot up in the course of this. And he writes, he, he, he was um, bringing up the rear uh, with, a, with a squadron, with a patrol, rather. Um, by this stage, he has joined uh, from the 85th. He has joined the American... U.S. Uh, uh, 22nd Aero Squadron, uh, the Shooting Stars, as they, they had their own little symbol. But as Samuel bringing up this patrol, he said, so when the nine Fokkers attacked us, Little and I were the first victims. About four of the red-nosed, blue-bodied bastards jumped on me. They had height and were in the sun, and all I could do was to wiggle. At that moment, I looked below and saw that five or six other Fokkers had come up and were attacking the rest of the patrol. In a dogfight like that, it soon develops into each man for himself and the devil take the hindmost. Well, I was the hindmost. At the same time, I didn't like the idea of being easy meat. No sooner would I avoid one than another was firing at me. Rat, tat, tat, tat. What a sound. And then a streak of pale, sickly, whitish blue smoke would whish over my head as the bullet flew by. Nick, he called his plane Nick after a friend who had fallen before him. Nick was absolutely riddled. I didn't even have a chance to fire a shot. I had to look in the back of me all the time. And with me, I don't like to fire unless my beads are on the other man's head. There's no, no use firing bullets wildly if they're not going to hit something. This isn't a 4th of July celebration just for noise and smoke, see what happens in the case of the year. This isn't a 4th of July celebration just for noise, sparks and smoke. He goes into a steep spiral dive with tracer and incendiary bullets going past him, then vertically downwards another 800 meters, letting the Germans think they'd hit him. And he eventually pulls out of it and makes his way somewhat unsteadily back to the airfield. His plane had been hit uh, uh, around a hundred times, it was uh, riddled. Um, a few days later, ten days later, and he pens what is to be um, his last letter. He didn't know that uh, the night before he died. Um, he fought uh, in the, on the opening day of the Meuse Argonne campaign, the big campaign at the end of the war to the Americans. Um, he was uh, leading a patrol out at the top of, um, for the historians ever read this, the Kriemhildestellung, which is the, the Hindenburg line at that part, which were the, uh, the back lines of the Germans in the terrain that the Americans were fighting. Uh, very, very, very difficult terrain uh, that Pershing and his armies had taken on. Three parts to this Meuse Argonne offensive. We have on the the right-hand side, the heights of the Meuse River with German gun emplacements ready to fire down on any forces attacking it. You've got the middle section ridged, uh, uh, um, um, crisscrossed with uh, um, razor wire with hit very well hidden gun and artillery emplacements. This was area where the Germans had been dug in since the autumn of 1914. They've been in there for four years. On the left side, the ridged mountainous and forested Argonne Forest. Um, 
pretty impossible uh, uh, to, to take on, but they did. Um, our, our lad Kimber goes up with uh, their, a, a, a large-ish patrol to the top of the area that they're, they're, uh, they're attacking to an area uh, near Grand Pre, a little town, Grand Pre, and he wanted to follow, the, there was a road that la, ran from Grand Pre up to a place called dune sur meuse which was a railway town of strategic significance. Um, and his squadron leader, Ray Bridgman, went one way with some guys. He decided to go up with a patrol of two others to strafe the roads up towards this dune sur meuse place. And it was about 11.30 in the, on the morning of the 26th of September, the opening morning of the Meuse Argonne. And he nosed his plane out of the, uh, out of the cloud and uh, dank day uh, in towards a place called Bonfield, which is halfway in the road, and a German uh, uh, field artillery anti-aircraft uh, battery took him out of the sky, catching some of the... Uh, bombs, the light bombs he had strapped on the side of his, uh, of his plane. Um, he fell to the ground um, and his, his, his body wasn't, they knew he had died, the, the body wasn't found uh, um, uh, after the war, uh, in the immediate time after the war. Um, and the, the, the book is bookended by uh, the search uh, for this body. So anyway, in 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 summary, uh, you know that was the life, service, and death of 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 Arthur Clifford Kimber, an American on the Western Front. The last eighteen months of the nineteen months of U.S. involvement in the war. It's only a snapshot. Only can be a snapshot. Just one story in America's war. Kimber wasn't the first into battle nor was he the last to die, but his story can help inform our overall understanding of the war. His life ended in late September 18, but six weeks later, the United States, as we know, fighting alongside Britain and France, had brought the war to an end. It's an invidious task and almost impossible, and there are better historians in this room attempt to sum up these 19 months of US involvement, or even a potted history of various Americas, battles in it, Cantigny, Chateau Thierry, Belle Wood, the Aisne Marne offensives, and the Battle of Soissons, and finally these two that I've spoken about, saint Miel, which was the largest collection of air power ever assembled in that war, 1,400 French, British, American, and Italian aircraft. And then, finally, the Meuse-Argonne Offensive. But I would say that the battles in which they served, and yes, we know it was late on in the war, and it was only ever could be a small part of that war, but I do believe, and I would leave you with the thought, that the Americans' role in the war was vital in stemming and then turning the tide on the German advance. Thank you. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we have a few minutes for uh, questions and answers. Is there anybody who'd like to start us out tonight? Oh, here we go, right in the middle. We can always count on you. Hello. So, did you get a sense of the strategic importance of air power in World War I from the Americans, uh, more so from the Americans, or was it, who, who were the, the main actors in air power in World War I? The, um, there was a, a saying at the time uh, when the American airmen were training that they would um, listen to what the Brits said to the North the French said to the south, the Italians somewhere to the west, and we'll go east, um, that they would try to, to aggregate the knowledge that was on hand. Um, in the training 
Um, uh, many techniques had been forged in war. Americans, as pioneers of flight, had been left um, very, very badly behind in the war uh, when they joined it in 1917, um, having to spend, um, at that stage, $640 million, even in today's terms, $640 million is $640 million. That's what they were spending in 1917 to try to get the American uh, aviation effort. And it was only still a pimple on the end of something else. It was still not highly regarded. So your question about um, the kind of the strategy that was um, evolving as the, they themselves caught up, got up to speed and they were trying to learn from people, America, uh, from Brits, from French, also observing the Germans, uh, trying to work out what the best tactics were. Um, Billy Mitchell, Colonel Billy Mitchell, who was um, uh, one of the famous uh, uh, commanders of the US Air Service uh, and uh, became the head of the zone of advance in those latter months, um, he was very much of a mind with uh, uh, Trenchard, who was the British commander uh, who uh, will tell you everything you know if you, if you hear that Hugh Trenchard was called Boom, right? Boom Trenchard, right? And he wanted, he saw the real strategic uh, uh, weaponry available with air power. He wanted to go in and use it as an offensive weapon, not just as something for observation and for reconnaissance and to help those on the ground. He saw it as a, as a weapon of first strike. And that's why you see with Samuel in mid-September of 18, you get this vast air armada assembled. So, you know, it's really kind of going on the front foot, really being aggressive with it. Um, and, um, but in the training, just very briefly, in the training, I was saying how they learned this from this ally, that from that ally, etc. The French instructors were regarded as being notably more cautious not in some sort of behind the door way, but in a way that was going to keep you alive faster. Um, basically, to, they were quite thorough in their training methods. And they had uh, learned, uh, actually from the Germans, uh, the French had learned to try to keep in formation when flying, to not be picked off because one young kid's uh, uh, blood would be up He'd just been shot up, let's go after somebody. Soon he'll be found on his own. That's what they wanted. They would wait in the cloud above or below, ready to try to pick off somebody and then go after somebody. That's how they did it. The idea was to keep a formation. So it was just, it was, um, pardon the pun, but it was a moving target in terms of the actual air doctrine and strategy that was evolving. All right, right here. Um, did he talk much about his uh, his mates, the type of people they were, either in the yeah. ambulance corps or the flying corps? Yeah. What well, what what is interesting is, and in the course of this, um, and you, you can picture. I mean, I'd love you, genuinely would love you to to read the book to just get a flavour of it. But um, I lived with this kid for kind of three years or something like that. I felt very keenly that <clears throat> um, last letter when it was written. But the, he, he changes as a person, he grows up uh, in the course of this. And um, I think that he starts off by being a little bit up himself. And I think he's a bit of, um, I think he regards himself as possibly slightly superior at the beginning. Those edges are rubbed off and it becomes a more uh, rounded person. And you can see him the numbers of people, the names of people, are kind of gradually introduced in these letters. And um, the, 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 he starts off with the kind of the American college boys, uh, a lot of them from Stanford, uh, but then he will mix with uh, whomsoever from the other colleges, but then he will be mixing with anyone and everyone uh, at a later stage. And I think that he becomes, as I say, probably a nicer person or probably a you know, more aware person and what's, what's um, uh, uh, tragic is just all this collection of people, um, uh, Bean and Jerry Jerome and Remington Vernon, some great names, um, but you know how one by one by one by one by one they die. Um, and it was pretty binary. It was either 
you get some of these guys who, when you look them up in later life, become CEOs of something or go on to great distinguished military service in some other branch or whatever, and there's just some other conflict. Um, it's either that or you die as a 21-year-old or 22-year-old in northern France. It was just like that, flip of a coin stuff. But, um, but it was, um, you know, he, 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 he was at uh, training school with uh, Quentin Roosevelt and um, at the gunnery school with him. And he was very sad to see Roosevelt go. He thought Roosevelt was a, was a good guy and who was not at all up himself. Um, said a newly reformed Arthur Clifford Kimber. Uh, he thought he was a, a regular guy. Um, but uh, nonetheless, he thought Roosevelt was a pretty reckless pilot. Going back to the earlier point of how training was assembled, he thought he was a little bit of a, you know, a maverick who wanted to go out and, and shoot people up. Um, <laughs> but anyway, so it, it's, it, it was just, you get to know these people along, you know, along the way and then they go. Is he memorialized at uh, any particular cemetery there? Uh, he is um, in the Mers Argonne Cemetery, but that, that is something that, as I say, the, 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 uh, is, is, um, is told in the course of the book about the, 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 the search for him, which is kind of long and painstaking. And he was, he was um, as I said towards the end there, he wasn't the first in, he wasn't the last to die, but he was um, among the last handful of people ever to be buried. Uh, at Mers Argonne in, the, in 1922, um, and uh, his, uh, his brother went looking for him. Just, to, just like everybody else, have you, have you been to the cemetery? And it's a, it's a picture-perfect cemetery. I was just saying um, to some of my new colleagues uh, over dinner tonight that um, you know, it's like Augusta National or something. It's perfect. It's beautiful. It's the loveliest cemetery, military cemetery I've ever been in. And, um, but it's, it's that, one of the th aspects of it is just so uniform, you know, with crosses, stars of David or whatever, along these, these, these rolling hills, and he's just one little cross in it. All right, we got one up here in the corner. That's the Tyrus I was talking about with the 85th Escadrille. Uh, that was the, the original sort of raging bull type thing. And, um, and then laterally, that's a SPAD 7 plane for those people who know their planes. And that's the SPAD 13 that he, uh, that he um, no, that's still him. I have to kind of wait for him. That's, that's the, there he is, the Joker. That's the new symbol that is adopted. That's the, uh, the SPAD 13, sorry. Did you have access to any letters that were written to him? Um, yes, uh, I did. And uh, um, um, the, there, were, there were letters um, from various friends and family, but we didn't really, um, they, they were more referred um, in letters by him. That, that's kind of was a way of shoehorning them in without losing that narrative um, because, um, and I've got a kind of large collection of letters from after the war um, of people who were then writing to the family. Um, so the Hoovers, they knew the Hoovers from Stanford and um, uh, um, Roosevelt and, um, you know, the various kind of, uh, you know, alumni of, of, of Stanford and the ambulance service, that kind of thing. But I didn't really, whilst we've got the letters, you know, it was it was quite difficult to shoehorn them in. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we have time for one more question right here. You had a uh, note, this one, from uh, Teddy. Yes. Do you know if he ever met Kimber, or was he just acquainted uh, with him through his son? Uh, no, so no, that was, um, no, Kimber Sr. was long dead, and um, so um, uh, he, he went, uh, young Arthur Clifford Kimber, went to um, Roosevelt's offices in what was the Cosmopolitan magazine um, on that day, May the 11th, 1917, before he left New York. He went along to see him, went along with his mother. His mother had accompanied him on, on the first leg of this, of this journey uh, from West Coast to East Coast. And, um, and 
Roosevelt remembered her, and um, so they went in. They, he made an appointment via some senator, some New York senator, to say, please, would you see this man? And he went in, but I thought it was his pride and joy. That was one of his Stanford notebooks that he took with him, you know, his kind of dear diary, you know. And uh, that's the, the flag ceremony, obviously. That's the color party. That's uh, self-explanatory. That's L'Illustration, my defunct magazine. And that's the guy on the right there. That's the French colonel who's handing over to the color party. And uh, that's when it was decorated with a croix de guerre by the uh, French 55th Division. This flag, incidentally, is still in existence. It went back safely to Stanford, and um, sadly, Stanford don't put it on display because it's kind of delicate, and it's not that delicate. They've taken it out for me for photographs of the book, but they make out as if it's the Shroud of Turin. And, um, but anyway, and it, is, it could be placed in a box, I believe, somewhere with respect. If anyone listens to this from Stanford, I apologize, but I, <laughs> I, I would love you to put it on display. I really would, I really would. <laughs>